Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're here live on Pulse FM with Councillor Nathan Zampronio and Mike Jeffries and the Duckman. Nathan, thank you very much for your time and coming in here this afternoon for us. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, so it's been a little while since we've had a chat, so I'd like to communicate with you from time to time with some of the different issues and local things that are going on. Uh, I believe you're running now as independent. All right then. Okay then. So I was elected to council for the first time in 2016 on the Liberal ticket. Uh, I still count myself as a good Liberal at heart. But last December, uh, I was seized by the advantages of standing as a good community independent. I'm still a member of the Liberal Party. It's not unusual for people to kind of be a Liberal, strike their colours, no deception, but to say that I'm sufficiently independent. And I think people appreciated that because... Firstly, many people approached me and congratulated me for that stand, and it, it's, a, it's a gesture saying I have no time for the Machiavellian politics, for the factional politics, for towing the line, and I'm uh, free to be critical of the Liberal Party uh, as, as I'm free to be critical of anybody else if it's in the service of securing good outcomes for the Hawkesbury community. Well, following up on that then, here's Nigel Farage giving his advice on how the Liberals might find their way again. Of course, I will say, Nathan, with politics and radio, there's plenty of advice. There's always plenty of advice. Oh, advice is always very cheap. Yes. But why do you think that the Liberals, particularly federally, although the state doesn't look too good either, have lost their way and what should be the new direction? Um, th- there are... Um, you know, failure has many fathers, many mothers. What is it? Success has <laughs> many, uh, many fathers, but failure is well, a bastard. Well, I, I, I think in this case, failure also has many fathers in the sense that there are many, <laughs> there are many causes. Fundamentally, I think that the reason that the federal government, uh, the coalition lost office, uh, is because they had a crisis of authenticity. Mm-hmm. I think they handled the pandemic reasonably well. I think they handled the economy reasonably well. But the, the, the smell of death accumulated around them and around Scott Morrison in particular when he was seen as an inauthentic or as a shallow uh, political leader. And I think people crave authenticity. I they do. You're absolutely right. That's Im- As much as it's an overworked word, you more than ever in this age, I think, got to be authentic. I can, I can say absolutely. So, you know, I've got Labor linings and all this stuff, true blue to the core, all that stuff hasn't changed too much. So a little bit less vocal. I think Scott Morrison did himself no favours during the bushfires and went down the bigger and tried to ingratiate himself with the public. That did not go down well. And that the picture of him shaking people's hand who lost everything, uh, sort of when they were just in despair, that really... That was a Look, very I could, bad. If I could, if I could draw a contrast, I mean, there are people who do that, and you, you you sense that it's merely for the photo op, and five minutes later they've gone and they've forgotten. Yeah. And then there are people who genuinely muck in, and um, I know he was a lightning rod figure, but I mean, Tony Abbott was a person of whom you could say, hand on heart, genuinely had a heart to help, and to this day, even as a former prime minister, mucks in with his local RFS, turned up to clean up uh, after the floods in this area, went out to Pitt Town. No photo crew, no media, you know, posse uh, did it just because it was the the civic thing to do. And I think people recognise that and respect that. Okay, here's here's something that I think leads into a very important part of existence in this part of the world. I read something yesterday that I hadn't thought about. You know, Albo wants us to buy electric cars and that'll be fantastic. But I read a piece that said, what about when disaster strikes? What about when there's a bushfire or flood? How are you going to be in your electric car, particularly, as I've noticed living here the last few years, you don't always have electricity to begin with. Um, Look, maybe, I think all disruptive and transformative technologies take a while to find their their critical mass. I mean, you could have made the same criticism about the advent of the internal combustion engine. Oh, well, when it runs out of fuel, where am I going to get this spiritus liquor that that you pour into the tank and makes it go as though by magic? Um, What's going to typify the 21st century is the distribution of our power networks and the fact that it won't come from a power station and be piped for miles through high-tension power lines before it comes out of your outlet, everybody's home is going to be a power station. Everybody's 
garage will contain some kind of storage device, whether it's a fuel cell or a Tesla battery. And the fact that power distribution networks will become more diffuse and that we rely increasingly on renewable sources of energy, that takes time. Well, I was going to say we're not going to get there overnight, are we? No, no, not overnight, and we're not there yet. And, you know, there are impediments to the uptake of electric vehicles at the moment. But what fascinated me was recently I went down to Canberra to a conference of, of, of national, a, a national conference of local governments around Australia, mm. over 500 different local government uh, regions around Australia. And in the expo space, there were people uh, selling commercially the technology to have electrically powered you know, garbage collection vehicles, electrically powered mowers, electri- electrically powered utility vehicles. And the argument that they're beginning to make is that you don't need to be a greenie to adopt these technologies now. They're genuinely more economic as a, as a proposition for a council over the entire life cycle. Still impediments to range and you know where you charge them and so forth. But these mm. are all answerable questions. Yep. We just need to build out the networks. Now, I was in a transport forum the other day with National Heavy Vehicle Regulator and some industry types that are looking at electronic vehicles and we're looking at hydrogen as a fuel source talking about fuel cells and I said I like the idea I I genuinely like the idea but the moment the range of these vehicles is very short range uh, and part of the problem they've got is there's not good facilities outside of the major metropolitan areas to supply uh, long range vehicles for electric vehicles to travel interstate Bathurst, Orange, Dubbo, that sort of regional areas outside of probably a hundred kilometre scope of Sydney although they are building uh Technology to where they're going to align with major fuel companies, which I, is good. I, I think fundamentally there's a, a broader proposition. It's in Australia's strategic interest to move to these technologies because at the moment we're paying foreign governments whom we could politely say don't like Western society very much and we're lining their pockets to, to, to cook up mischief against us. And why would we do that when there are technological alternatives that are not only uh, going to take keep that revenue on shore, uh, but which are better for the environment and better for future generations. That opens up to a couple of very good points, I think. But just staying with that generation thing, I just wonder how much you think of it as pie in the sky. For example, there's this wonderful talk about... And hydrogen, at first glance, looks like a great idea. In fact, I think it might outlive the battery car, the hydrogen fuel cell. But I was reading about a scheme that's proposed for Western Australia to make Australia a leader, you know, in providing green hydrogen and all that. So they want 15,000 square kilometres. Now, you picture that. That means if it's a rectangle, it's like 100 kilometres on one side and 150 on the other. Uh, It's going to run on desalinated ocean water. Wow, (laughs) that's a big ask for a start. Expected to be completed maybe about 2030 and going to cost around 100 B with a billion a hundred billion US dollars, and you think, really, is that going to happen? I, I, I think moonshot projects like that, um, they may have a certain advantage because of their economy of scale. But I think the way that we're going to transform our economy into a clean energy economy is incrementally uh, by people choosing to buy a hybrid vehicle. When I bought a car two years ago, I bought a hybrid. Mm. It, it consumes half as much fuel. When the fuel became really expensive, I was laughing people putting solar on their houses, people choosing to augment that with with battery storage. And I think it's by slow degrees and by creating a favourable regulatory environment that we're going to uh, eventually completely transform our economy. So we brought you in. One of the main things we want to chat to you about, there's been a lot of talk at the moment about Warragamba Dam raising the dam wall on the back end of three major mm-hmm. flood events that happened this year. One, the most recent one, made, what, the top ten of all time in, in this area since White Settlement, I believe? Well, we'll put it this way. This community, in fact, where we sit right now, endures the greatest unmitigated, in other words, untempered risk uh, of flooding in the country and one of the greater f- risks of flooding I- in the entire world. We've built a floodplain where 150,000 people live and trade every day and... We have no mitigation capacity on our main dam. Warragamba Dam, built in 1960, was not built as a flood mitigation dam. And it can be a flood mitigation dam by accident, 
and I cite the flood that we had in February 2020. Now, at that point, we were at the tail end of a terrible drought and the dam had gone down to well under 50%. So it was half empty. We had a significant rainfall event at that time and the, the dam filled up and then topped and there was a moderate flood, about nine metres. If the dam had been full at that time, the flood would have been at least three and a half metres higher and it would have been the kind of more major catastrophe that we've had in July of this year. Now, what they're proposing to do, what the state government is proposing to do, is to raise Warragamba Dam by over 14 metres and to keep that empty as much as they can because there's a maximum water storage level, which is current maximum water storage level, and then to create an air gap and to uh, have uh, a permanent buffer so that when significant rainfall events come, and we know that 70% of all floodwaters come from this, that part of the catchment that sits behind Warragamba Dam. Many people cite anecdotally the inputs of other parts of the catchment. They say, oh, what about the Gross or the Colo or the Nepean uh, or, or the McDonald Rivers? But they are statistically, generally, a, a lower proportion, a much lower proportion. The best bang for buck sits with raising Warragamba Dam. So they did, a, they did a study. In fact, there have been multiple studies, and another one was mooted only just this week, saying, well, you know, if you're going to spend money to mitigate floods, what do you do? You build levees, or do you build dams on other parts of the catchment, or do you blast the, ch the choke points at Sackville Gorge, or do you dredge the river, try and make it deeper? And they looked at all of those, and they came down on the side of the best bang for buck being raising Warragamba Dam. And that's the only thing that's going to properly mitigate floods. We could lower the permanent water storage level and it would make a very modest difference. Now, recently that's become very topical. I'm on board with that. I think it's something that we can do now. Um, but it's little better than symbolism. I mean, if, it, if we lowered the permanent water storage level by five metres, that would affect the level of a flood like we had recently by about 60 centimetres, by about that much. I mean... You know, if, 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 your, if your house sits between, you know, 11 and 11.6 metres, maybe it makes all the difference in the world to you, and that's why I'm prepared to support this. But the only thing that's really going to mitigate against a really bad flood, and I mean the kind of flood that's worse than what we had in July, worse than what we had earlier this year, worse than what we had last year, I'm talking about the 1 in 100 type flood, 17.3 metres, or the 1867 type flood, which is over 19 metres. You've got to raise Warragamba Dam. So you've, you've seen the stats and you spoke to historians in the area. If we had a Warragamba Dam at the time of the 1867 flood, mm -hmm. would that have been mitigated so that didn't happen as severe as it did? So the 1867 flood came as the result of only four days of rain. And as, is, as has always been the case, it depends on it falling in the wrong part of the catchment. Because the catchment's over 23,000 square kilometres and it stretches almost all the way down to Goulburn. And um, uh, if Warragamba Dam had been in place then, I don't know that they've done that specific modelling because it's probably difficult to know at this remove of time precisely where in the catchment it fell. It was enough to know that it fell in the catchment and then it ended up on the floodplain. What we do know is that for the majority of the kinds of flood that we have, we are going to have the best mitigation by raising that part of the dam. Yeah. So uh, I do know that, uh, about that flood event, that there was a flood event and then there was like a secondary flood event, which pretty much like what happened in July. Uh, for the second flood event we had this July, I really feel it was much worse than what it could have been because of what happened, it, the look, flood we got in March initially. Well, let, let's look historic and let's look now. In 1867, the contemporary records say that there was an inland sea that stretched from Riverston to the foot of the Blue Mountains, that the beaches between Barrenjoey and Long Reef were black with the debris that came out through Broken Bay, uprooted trees, dislodged soil, people's goods and cattle, bloated livestock, possibly human corpses. We know that many people lost their lives, like the Ether family that lost you know, so many people in just one night. Now, in terms of what happens now... Um, uh, raising Warragamba Dam will, would have lowered a, a March 2021 flood, I cite March 2021, because that's the one we've got the modelling for. There was a report that came out. It would have lowered that flood by three and a half metres 
That's a significant reduction. That would have spared... So make it a moderate flood as opposed to a major flood. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, we, we know that in the March 2021 flood, there were 600 houses inundated. 500 of those 600 would have been spared completely if the flood had been three and a half metres lower. The most recent flood, uh, easily over 800 houses and possibly more. We don't have the figures yet. We've got some indicative figures based on the number of insurance claims that have been lodged and um, you know the number of people who required assistance in the immediate aftermath for cleanup. Yeah. All right. You want to roll on there for a minute, Mike? Yes, by all means. Uh, yeah, it was certainly a heartbreak. You only got to look at the old cemetery at uh, Windsor, the one near the railway station there. Mm-hmm. And uh, whole families wiped out. But something you said earlier, I thought, gave an opening to what I've been on about all my life. When I was a kid in school, and that was more than 10 years ago now, believe me, uh, I was told that Australia would become the value-added country. Instead of just ripping the bauxite out of the ground and selling it as such, we'd at least turn into aluminium ingots and maybe Audis. Mm -hmm. Now, even in my lifetime, though, we used to make things God bless Gladys Berejiklian for saying we're not good at making things. Well, we used to. We used to make trains and we used to make TVs and we used to make blenders and stoves and hills hoists and all sorts of things. I would have thought of all the countries in the world with the know-how that we had, the agricultural land and all the resources in the ground, including uranium, and a nice motor around us. We're better equipped than anybody to stand on our own two feet, be independent, but still be friendly with the neighbours. Do you think there's any real chance of manufacturing coming back into this country? Well, the first observation I'll make is that you're inviting me to comment on things that are well above my pay grade as a a local government (laughs) councillor here in the Hawkesbury. But still. But as a man of the world, I'm perfectly happy to to offer you an opinion. Yeah. Many years ago, I read a fascinating book by Thomas Friedman called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. It was the first book that I read that properly explained to me the phenomenon of globalisation mm. and how the, the global economy is an interconnected web and that you know the ideas tend to come from advanced Western countries and then they outsource their manufacturing to countries with cheap labour. Mm. And that's come at a terribly dislocating cost to traditional manufacturing industries. We no longer have a motor vehicle manufacturing industry in Australia. Um, we, we no longer have um, you know heavy industry. We've closed foundries and forges and smelters and refineries. And um, the lens through which I tend to look at this through is the strategic importance of preserving some kind of manufacturing. Well, that's never been more uh, an issue than right now because if China takes over Taiwan and we can't get the semiconductors, the Western world generally is going to be totally screwed, isn't it? I I think it would be a a massive... There would be a massive impact to the global economy if there was a hot war with China. Yeah. And I think everybody of sense wants to avoid that at every cost. China is very bellicose in its rhetoric, but um, that's partly... Uh, um, Xi Jinping playing to his domestic audience because he has troubles of his own in hanging on to power. It would in, seem so, in, yes. In in China, uh, uh, apart from their entrenched belief that Taiwan is a part of China, even though the Taiwanese people have made it abundantly clear that they don't want That's to right. be a part of China. They, they yeah. value their independence. It's curious to me, and I'm sticking my neck out in saying this, preface, I'm very low on the political food chain, so my remarks ought not have any particular international implications. Australia shares America's strategic ambiguity about Taiwan. You will never see a federal parliamentarian saying that they support Taiwanese independence, because it it, it calms the nerves. I think it's come time, high time in fact, for Australia to say that they support Taiwanese independence, and that Taiwan if that's truly the will of their people, deserve to be completely autonomous and completely independent in the same way that Australia played a very noble role in the independence of East Timor, which I think was one of the the glory notes in Australian 
history. Well, that's a good point. I, I agree. But, you know, old Labour Party saying you can always put your money on self-interest, you know it'll be trying on the day. We simply cannot afford, you know, you talk about a hot war. Even if we don't go to a hot war, if China controls Taiwan but doesn't want to send us semiconductors, where does that leave the rest of the Western world? I think it's in China's self-interest to maintain its good economic relations with the rest of the world. Yeah. And the fact that China's rhetoric has resulted in major firms like Apple and, and, and others now looking for alternatives to repatriate their manufacturing capacity to America or to put them in uh, competitive economies like India means that China is losing its international cachet as the default place to which you, you, you subcontract all of that manufacturing. Well, so I would hope that would be the case, but you talk about Apple. They're taking the Made in Taiwan stickers off their products hoping that uh, that'll buy them some time sucking up to China. Look, I, I, I am not the kind of person that wants to kowtow to China. Yeah. I, I think there are people who have a vested interest in doing so. I'm not one of those people. I'm yeah. unlikely to travel to China. Um, and um, I, I just tend to side instinctively with those people who are fighting and, and, and spilling their own blood and, and, and coin to... Uh, have the kind of autonomy that we take for granted here in Australia. I think of the people in Hong Kong, for example. I think we should stand resolutely beside the people of Hong Kong. Mm. And if that means displeasing China, then so be it. General one. Unfortunately, we're going to need to pull this interview up early. Uh, I apologise for that. Uh, I've been told I uh, need to queue it up now. Uh, thanks for your time, Nathan. Do want to go on more with this. Uh, We'll follow this up more for sure. you get a copy of this as well. And uh, this will go out onto Pulse FM as well uh, at a later time this week. There were so many subjects that we were going to cover, Matthew. Uh, but we'll save that for another time. We absolutely will. So thanks for your time, Mike. Thanks as always. Hey, you're welcome. I, I was just really getting interested yeah. in all this. Let's do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely keen to do this again.